Okay, welcome to another IB Business and Management production. We're still on this topic of marketing. In fact, we've only just begun it, haven't we? This is 4.2, Marketing Planning. I'm Mr. Burton, and this video will be hosted on ibbusinessandmanagement.com. Enjoy. Marketing Planning, we're looking at objectives. Remember, Everything the firm is planning to do is in terms of goals. Objectives are those medium to long term goals. For example, the marketing objective of increasing sales volumes by 10% in the next year. Marketing activities will need to be planned around this and appropriate strategies formulated to meet the objectives. Right, effective marketing planning is always based on a clear awareness of three things. Firstly, market trends. Is our market growing? Is it shrinking? Has it reached saturation point? Competitors action. What are our rivals doing in the market? How is this likely to impact on us? And consumer wants. What do our consumers want? What are their needs? What are we missing? What are we getting right? Now to determine consumer wants, we need to conduct good, effective market research. Show me. In fact, market research, good effective market research is going to be able to establish all of these things. For us. Now marketing planning begins with a marketing plan funnily enough. Now the marketing plan is going to contain detailed action programs. This just means what we plan to do, when, how. Budgets. How much is it going to cost us? How much do we anticipate to get back in return? Sales forecasts. How much are we going to sell as a result of these new marketing activities? and when are our sales going to increase and for how long so sales forecast becomes important and strategies strategies which are largely going to be based on our marketing mix marketing mix the key the marketing mix the key decisions that must be taken in the effective marketing of a product so we have the four p's product price promotion and place. Okay, the marketing mix is a nice, simple, easy to remember mnemonic. Four P's product, price, promotion, and place. Very easy to remember, but it perhaps simplifies some trickier concepts. I'll run through a little video in a second. That's an excellent video. It explains the four P's very clearly, very precisely. So for example, with the product, we're not it it goes through all the decisions surrounding the product decision, product final decision. And at the end you'll note that the market research should be determining the marketing mix. The marketing mix is going to be dependent on what you find out about your market. Let's have a look. A new look at the four P's of marketing. Nothing explains a complicated business algorithm like a cute mnemonic device. Hence, the four P's of marketing. This is one of the first things they drill into your head in business school. Actually, in any type of formal marketing instruction. It's everywhere. Everyone knows it, and you need to know it too. So here it is. Let's go. Four P's. Product, place, price, promotion. Got that? Let's say it again. Say it out loud, it helps. Product, price, place, promotion. One more time, with feeling. Product, place, price, promotion. Never forget these four words. Each of the four P's represents one of the really, really important elements of marketing that you need to consider when developing your campaigns. Alone, none of them will do you much good. The four P's need to work together. They're like the four wheels of a car or the four legs of a table. 
If you've got trouble with, or heaven forbid, are missing one entirely, you'll have trouble getting anywhere. So it's easy, right? Find a good product, slap a good price on it, sell it somewhere people go, and throw together some promotion. Yes? No. Because first you have to figure out how to define these things as good. It's all about fit. Each of the four P's has to be geared towards your specific target market and work with each of the other four P's to do so. The first P is product. This is what you're selling, be it a pot scrubber, ebook, or car detailing service. But it's not just the item or service itself that's included in the product P. It's also the different varieties of your product, the quality of it, how it's designed, packaged, and branded. Anything that adds value to your product, any reason a customer might want to purchase it is part of the product. Obviously, it's pretty important. The next P is price. You may be tempted to believe that the price of your product or service is merely the amount you charge customers when they purchase it. Dispel that notion immediately. The price includes the retail price, any discounts or special offers, bonuses, payment plans, and credit terms. In short, anything even remotely related to money. It makes sense when you think about it. A discount lowers the price of an item. A bonus offer also lowers the price. Credit terms and payment plans make it easier for your customers to pay the price. All of these must be considered. The third P is promotion. This is what most people think of when they think of marketing. Promotion includes advertising, personal selling, sales promotion, and public relations. Sponsoring your nephew's Little League game? That's promotion. Making a sales call? That's promotion. Handing out brochures? That's promotion. Answering client emails? Still promotion. The final P is place. Place is also known as distribution. How do your clients find your product and get what they've paid for once they've paid for it? Is it delivered to their door? Is it right there in a retail location? Do they download it? Place also includes the logistics of each of these things. If your product is sold in retail stores, how did it get there? How many of them are there? How soon do you need to get more there? Everything that you need to consider about how to get your product to your customer or to a place where your customer can find it is part of place. Now remember, it's not enough to choose a good product, price, place, and promotion because we have to know how to define good. Let's use an example to illustrate. Let's say that your seven-year-old wants to set up a lemonade stand to make some extra money. What will she have to figure out? She'll need to decide where to place her stand, how to make the lemonade, what she should charge for it, and how to let people know what she's doing. If she came up to you and asked you how to do all of this, you'd have to tell her that it depends. Where she sets up her stand depends on who she wants to sell the lemonade to, grown-ups or kids. Should the stand be in the park or at the end of her driveway? Same with the recipe. How much sugar should she add? More for kids than for grown-ups, probably. If she makes grown-up lemonade, she might be able to charge more for it because adults have more money to spend. On the other hand, if she sets up her stand in the park and sells sweet lemonade to kids, more of them will see it and she won't have to tell people about it. You have to know who your target market is before you make any of the 4P decisions or you'll be in the same mess as a 7-year-old, not knowing which course of action is best for any of the P's. If the 7-year-old knew from the get-go that she wanted to sell lemonade to other kids, she would have been able to decide right away that she should have a sweet lemonade product that she should sell in the park, place promotion, for 10 cents a cup. Price. If she wanted to sell to grown-ups, she would have her stand at the end of her driveway where lots of adults walk to and from work. Place. The lemonade would be tart. Product. Her mom would probably tell some of her neighbors about it. Promotion. And she could charge 25 cents a cup. Price. At the end of the day, it comes down to figuring out your target market and what works for them. Your offering will be perfect for some people, and those are the ones you need to reach. Want more lessons and tips like this one? Subscribe to the FirepoolMarketing.com blog or sign up for a free 7-day business fireproofing video course. Okay, I apologize if the sound there is not that great, but the video is great, so... If you missed it, the sound wasn't that flash, please go to ibbusinessandmanagement.com and watch it there. It's embedded. It's well worth a look. Take notes. Very important points. Well explained. Show me. Just a quick mind map of the marketing mix. Product, all the things surrounding product, branding, 
what sort of functions, how good is the design, how well designed is it, what accessories might it have, what support are you offering customers in relation to their product, how good is the quality, what packaging are you going to put it in, coming into price, what pricing strategy are you going to use, there are a few of those, we'll look at those, recommended retail price, what's that going to be, are you going to offer discounts for volume, are they going to be wholesale discounts, are you going to bundle it with other products, discriminate with your pricing, and how flexible are you going to be with that pricing? Promotion, how are you going to inform your customers? What strategy are you going to use? Advertising. What personnel are you going to use to sell it? Perhaps direct selling? Marketing? Public relations? Sales promotions? What budget are you going to use uh, allow for the marketing place what channels of distribution are you going to use how well, how much inventory are you going to stock will you need warehousing how are your customers going to order it how are you going to process those orders so everything very integrated nice little mind map there We'll just expand on the marketing mix in a little bit more detail now. Product price promotion in place, very easy to remember. Now if we are talking services as well, the marketing mix around services, we also include people, processes and physical evidence. We'll have a look at these last. Product. Consumers require the right product. Your product is the solution to a problem that the consumer might have. So it could be an existing product, it could be an adaptation, a change, something different to an existing product out there. It could be a new product, completely, a completely new product. Price. Price is not just important in the terms of your customers, your consumers ability to purchase your product, but it can play a role in the product perception. A high price is generally, generally tend to be perceived as a high quality good, high, high quality product. And price is definitely going to have an impact on a firm's revenues. The price of a good and how much it's sold. promotion it's got to be effective the customers need to know it's available and you need to be able to convince them that your band brand is best place how your product is going to be distributed to the consumer the right time right place And quickly looking at the expanded marketing mix in regards to services, people. Selling services successfully requires people who can interact positively with customers and create the correct impression to encourage them to come back. Now it's particularly important with um, industries such as the hotel and restaurant business. Processes that a business has in place to satisfy customers wants reliably and consistently form an important part of marketing of services. For example, banks replacing an out of date debit card without the customer having to ask for one. Great process, make the customer very happy, likely to come back, recommend you. Physical evidence means that allowing customers to see for themselves the quality of the service being provided as opposed to a tangible product. For example, a clean and well presented reception area in a hotel would raise appropriate expectations in the mind of the customer. You've got a quick textbook question here. Remember organizational objectives. Organization the objectives are important. A quick activity here. What went wrong? I'm going to show you four P's surrounding a product. Identify which marketing mix decision is not integrated with the other decision. Remember, they're all dependent, they're all interrelated, they're one impacts on the other. So the marketing mix needs to be consistent. 
identify what is wrong, which one and which one of those things is not like the other, and recommend and justify a change to one of the marketing mix decisions. Product A, a sports car, high price, the place is an exclusive dealership, an impressive city showrooms, and the promotion advertised on radio only. Why only on radio? It doesn't quite fit, does it? Second product, a range of furniture for families with low incomes. A low price that matches the target market. The place is sold over the internet. Hmm, we'll come back to that. Let's have a look at promotion. Promotion advertised on posters and in free local newspapers. Yeah, that looks all right too. Why are we only selling over the internet? Families with low incomes might not be able to afford the computer equipment nor the relevant internet service to be able to place your order. Products. The next product, women's fashion hairdressing salon with cutting by well-known stylists. A low price, so oh, that's interesting. Low price offers to large family groups. The place is a salon located in a wealthy area of the city and promotion advertised in fashion and beauty magazine. One of these things is not like the other and that low price offered to large family groups is the one that doesn't match. Well, cut by well-known stylists should be able to command a premium price. Fast food restaurant with a high price strategy. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, place expensive business district location with many top class restaurants. Interesting, it matches the price so. And the promotion advertised in business magazines, loyalty card scheme operated with quality stores. Product is the odd one out here. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at is marketing ethics. A great way to introduce a marketing ethics topic is to look at this documentary, Consuming Kids. I guarantee you're not going to see any cannibalism here, but it highlights, exposes, introduces some of the less ethical marketing practice that go on in targeting our children. Very interesting. It's the first part of the video. I'd recommend watching the whole thing if it piques your interest. Um, you can find that at ibbusinessmanagement.com or the whole thing is there on YouTube.
There are now more than 52 million kids under 12 in all in the United States. The biggest burst in the U.S. youth population in half a century. And for American business, these kids have come to represent the ultimate prize. An unprecedented, powerful, and elusive new demographic to be cut up and captured at all costs. There's no doubt that marketers have their sights on kids because of their increasing buying power. The amount of money they now spend on everything from clothes to music to electronics, totaling some $40 billion every year. But perhaps a bigger reason for marketers' interest in kids may be the amount of adult spending that American kids under 12 now directly influence an astronomical $700 billion a year. Roughly the equivalent of the combined economies of the world's 115 poorest countries. One economic impact of children is the money that they themselves spend. The money that they get from their parents or grandparents, the money that they get as allowance, when they get older, the money that they earn themselves. That is, a, is an increasingly significant amount of money. But that's not where the real money is. Marketers and advertisers have realized that the real money related to the children's market is in their purchasing influence. Any questions? Jared, does Julian trade? <laughs> does that work for you? Because of their purchasing power and because of their purchasing influence, marketers and advertisers have become much more deliberate in their strategies and attempts to how to influence those dollars. Sienna, because kids come first. It's the children who often determine what kind of car gets bought, what kind of computer gets bought, what kind of cell phone program, and even where they take family holidays. What's your favorite part of the big hotel? The awesome pools. Having my own room? The arcade rocks. I like the shops. I like eating with SpongeBob. Most parents and other people just don't realize how corporate marketers intentionally try to, well, in essence, uh, make parents absolutely miserable. have actually studied the whole nagging phenomenon, which corporations do nagging better, and they provide advice to corporations about, you know, what kinds of tantrums work better. Children sometimes say, you know, can I, can I, can I, as much as nine times. Will you take it to Mount Splashmore? No. Will you take it to Mount Splashmore? No. Will you take it to Mount Splashmore? No. And part of the nag factor is designed to help maximize the number of times children will keep asking. Keep asking. No! 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 Mark? No! Will you no! Take no! Mark? If I take you, will you two shut up and quit bugging me? Yeah, of course. Well, we you take a mouth flash more? Yes! Thanks, Dad. So, these kids have a lot of power in the economy. The advertisers know it. And they are going after them in a way that is unprecedented. It's the place where I want to be. This generation of children is marketed to as never before. Kids are being marketed to through brand licensing, through product placement, marketing in schools, through stealth marketing, through viral marketing. There's DVDs, there's video games, there's the internet, there are iPods, there are cell phones. There are so many more ways of reaching children so that there's a brand in front of a child's face every moment of every day. What we have is the rise of 360 degree immersive marketing where they try and get around the child at every aspect, at every avenue. Kids are inundated with this. They are buried in this. Buried in this media blitz. Kids are now multitasking with media. Hello? Hey girl, what's up? No way. using more than one medium at the same time. So they're surfing the web and the television's going with MTV and they've got the iPod with one earbud in and they are more vulnerable and are bombarded with over 3,000 commercial messages every day. Marketers know these are little sponges. They're so wide open. They want to get that brand loyalty for life because that's big bucks. It's about people wanting to convince our children that life is about buying. Life is about getting. Can I help you? Yeah, I'm here to see this. Go ahead.
so the philosophy becomes cradle to grave. Let's get to them early. Let's get to them often. Let's get to them as many places as we can get them. Do you have a business card? Sure. Not just to sell them products and services, but to turn them into lifelong consumers. I'll see you in about 20 years. for cereal with sugar in it, and it wants to stop all advertising aimed at young children. This ban was based in part on concern about sugar cereals and cavities, and also based on research that indicated that children eight and under did not understand the persuasive intent of advertising. Are you saying that every message directed to the older child, the child between eight and 12, okay. is inherently deceptive? That's right. I think the child cannot bring enough information to bear not to be deceived and to have an unfair trade practice. So what ended up happening was the industries that were going to be affected, the toy industries, the sugar cereal companies, went to Congress. And that in an American democratic capitalistic society, we almost learn top to bottom to care for ourselves. And what the last thing we need in the next 20 years is a national nanny. And Congress ended up taking away a lot of the FTC's authority to regulate marketing to children. Far from addressing consumer advocates' concerns about the impact of advertising on kids, in 1980, Congress passed the FTC Improvement Act. The law mandated that the FTC would no longer have any authority to promulgate any rules regarding children's advertising. The Congress of the United States, under pressure from advertisers and marketers, actually robbed, took away from the Federal Trade Commission the right, the authority, to regulate advertising and marketing to children. Right, definitely get to YouTube or ibbusinessandmanagement.com where the whole thing is embedded. Uh, fascinating insight into unethical, to say the least, marketing practices involved at targeting children okay so marketing ethics we've looked at ethical standards and uh, business decision making before that was in the first topic uh, but they become a particular significance in the work of marketing departments and there are definite laws and regulations being established that to protect us from some of these unethical marketing practices. Your activity now is to complete watching the Consuming Kids video and identify 10 examples of unethical marketing practice that you see occurring. Explain why they are unethical. 
and another two activities as well uh, research and identify and explain five unethical marketing practice make non-child related right because you've already been through and done that with consuming kids and your second activity research identify and explain three ways that marketing is regulated so that's the laws around marketing the laws governing marketing practices different countries you'll probably find have different laws as we saw in that um, short little short little snippet of consuming kids the United States has practically nothing to protect children in being targeted by uh, in by marketing by promotions you want to sell junk food you want to sell sh sugary cereal to children you can target them as much as you want whereas in Sweden you can't advertise to children during the day which I think is absolutely brilliant well done Sweden marketing audit now marketing audits a regular review of the cost and effectiveness of a marketing plan and this includes an analysis of external and internal influences your analysis your marketing audit should actually spell out what's external and what's internal now the three key features with any marketing audit the first one we are focusing on what's internal so analysis of the business's internal strengths and weaknesses and how they've changed since the last audit so perhaps we've got an example here that the successful marketing manager has since left the company creating a weakness and that weakness is internal and if we're done with the internal we start with the external and again it's opportunities and threats and how these have changed since the last audit so it has a new rival perhaps has entered the mar market an external threat and thirdly review the progress of the marketing plan you started with the marketing plan how well has it been going market share compare with objectives at the start actual sales performance compared with original budgets and whether the company is achieving its smart objectives so those are three key features as well as the progress of the marketing plan marketing objectives targets that the marketing department wishes to achieve now remember they are medium to long term things marketing objectives provide purpose direction and motivation they allow progress to be monitored and success to be assessed help in the planning and development of appropriate strategies objectives let's have a look at some common marketing objectives diversification um, the objective of successfully marketing new products in new markets high risk strategy um, and only tends to be used by financially stable businesses market share increasing maintaining market share can be achieved through market penetration strategies uh, have a look in unit 1.7 about that um, anything that allows the business to increase sales revenue and profits in relation to its competitors now remember remember key point sales can and unit sales and volume of sales and value of sales can all be increasing while market share is decreasing market leadership the firm aims to have the greatest market share in an industry product positioning refers to attempts to change the image of the organization held by consumers we'll have a little bit more of an in-depth look at that later with perception maps consumer satisfaction ensuring that consumers are content with issues such as the quality of the product and the price market development the objective of selling existing products in new markets and uh, so perhaps for example international marketing is coming to play new product development 
involves businesses aiming to sell new products in existing markets and it's a common marketing objective for firms operating in high-tech industries high-tech industries new products are rolled out all the time because technology changes so quickly and products get outdated really quick standing market standing refers to the extent to which a firm has a presence in the marketplace largely based on an organization's image and reputation which can be maintained or enhanced by effective marketing strategies and with any objectives they're not a given there are constraints to achieving any objective finance the size of a firm's marketing budget will determine the marketing activities that can be undertaken to reach or achieve the objectives cost of production the firm's costs determine its capacity to compete on price and on quality so the lower the cost the lower the price the more price competitive the firm size and status of firm firms that do not have a high market standing might be unable to achieve their marketing objectives as they are relatively unknown time lags always 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 a delay between an organizations marketing activities and expenditure before it has any impact on customers uh, so there could be short-term liquidity problems activities and reactions of competitors rival businesses might launch new or improved products which hinder the success of the firm's marketing and in addition competitors are likely to respond to the marketing of the business and price wars for example could get started state of the economy much harder for a business to achieve its marketing objectives during a global recession uh, global recession consumers and businesses are more careful about their spending